I'm going to sort of start with a conversation about your book and some of the, the lessons you've drawn over your years uh, in diplomacy and for 33 years and some of the biggest pivot points in our, in our country's modern history. But then I'm going to turn you to the things that are in the news today and to see how those lessons might play out under those. Uh, but let's start in the very beginning, not the very beginning, but early in our country's life when Tocqueville <coughs> was uh, observing things about uh, our democracy and what, what makes it potentially uh, resilient over these years. Uh, ask you about, about his observation and whether you, you feel it's, well, you know, what, what will carry us through now? Um, well, first, it's, it's great to be with you again and great to be with all of you. Um, yeah, Tocqueville, who was a you know, I thought a pretty astute observer of American society a couple of centuries ago, um, once observed that what made Americans exceptional was not that we're better than anybody else, but it was our capacity to fix our mistakes. Now, I wish today we weren't testing ourselves in the way that we are um, testing that capacity, but I think there's a lot of truth in that as well. And, I, you know, I Despite all the damage we're doing to ourselves at home, I do have faith in the resilience of domestic institutions. I do worry a little bit more about our role and our influence on the international landscape because we're digging a hole for ourselves, in my view, at a time when the rest of the world is in the midst of profound transformation. It's not just you know, the rise of China, the resurgence of Russia, the you know, re-emergence of great power rivalry, but it's also the huge new challenges floating above geopolitics of climate change, the biggest existential threat I think we face, the revolution in technology, you know, with huge potential benefits, but lots of dislocations, and the competition in ideas now, I think, between democratic systems like our own, which, you know, are in a tough patch, and authoritarian systems that feel the wind in their sails. And so while we're digging that hole, it's not like the rest of the world is sitting still. And my concern, getting back to Tocqueville's point about fixing our mistakes, is that we'll stop digging eventually. When we climb back to the top of the hole, my concern is we're going to look out on a landscape that's hardened against our interests and in some ways against the values that matter not just to us but to lots of other people in the world. So. I'm a long-term optimist, but in the short term, I'm, I'm quite concerned. One of the things the Carnegie Endowment, which, which you lead, one of the things it, it did, perhaps in the, in the 90s and, and beyond, was focus our attention on transnational dangers, mm -hmm. those it, including global health issues, right. but terrorism, uh, the, the full range, all of those problems that no single country can manage on its own. And, and this feels like a moment that cries out for global governance right now, but yet at the, and you know, sort of strengthening of norms and institutions and processes mm -hmm. for dealing collaboratively with these dangers, and yet unilateralism is so on the rise. Do you, do you have a sense of why and whether that is likely to continue and it's a matter of well, finding a new way? You know, part of it, I, I began the book deliberately, you know, at the end of the Cold War, which was relatively early in my career when I worked in the George H.W. Bush administration for Secretary of State James Baker. And, you know, that was a moment of kind of unrivaled American power. I don't mean this as a statement of American arrogance, but we were the singular dominant player on the landscape. Um, the world's changed today in lots of respects. We're no longer the only big kid on the geopolitical block. And yet we have all these overarching challenges, as you mentioned, which are beyond the capacity of any one country or any one institution to deal with. And so, you know, it, this is a moment when I still think the United States in many respects has a better hand to play than our major rivals. But that's not only because of our military leverage and our economic leverage. It's also because, I think, of our capacity to draw on alliances and help mobilize coalitions of countries to deal with some of those challenges. That's what sets us apart from lonelier powers, in a sense, like China and Russia. But that's an asset that we can easily squander, and I'm afraid we're corroding it pretty badly yeah. today. And hard to rebuild. And very hard to rebuild, especially at a moment when so much of that landscape is in flux. So it's a very dangerous intersection, in a way, of us abandoning for all the mistakes that we made, and I worked for five presidents and 10 secretaries of state over the years, administrations of both parties. My record is hardly pristine as I try to you know, lay out in the book. 
But, you know, most of those leaders were animated by a sense of enlightened self-interest, a sense that our self-interest, the interests of the United States, which, which in a way always have to come first in foreign policy, were better served when we made common cause with lots of other countries that shared some of those basic interests. And I'm afraid today what we're doing in the Trump era is turning that idea of enlightened self-interest on its head. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot more about the self part than the enlightened part. Mm -hmm at a moment when I think, you know, that kind of sensibility is more important than ever for the United States and the world. Well, one of the changes we've been witnessing of late is, is in, in domestic politics, but mm -hmm. it seems to have a contagion about it, seeing formerly liberal democracies mm -hmm. trend toward illiberal democracies. The voting, vote may be sacrosanct, but, yeah. but individual liberties are not, the defense no. of individual liberties. You know, you you focused a lot on Europe um, uh, just as the Warsaw Pact came mm -hmm. apart. That you were in in government then. Um, you've you know a great deal about Asia, including Russia uh, mm -hmm. as well. Having served as the as our ambassador to Moscow. That's where my gray hair came from. Yeah. So, oh, I thought that was all Washington. I thought those well, were your Washington states. That was a contributing factor. You're right. <laughs> yeah. Um, but you know. Turkey, Philippines, Russia, yeah. uh, Poland, Hungary, Brazil, you know, us to some right. extent. Um, is, is this a top worry on your mind? It is, because you see, I mean, I was just in, in Britain uh, two weeks ago for a series of book events. And, you know, here we are at the same time on both sides of the Atlantic having political nervous breakdowns. I mean, the only mm -hmm. good thing in a way about being in London was you're so consumed by Brexit that you don't focus as much on the Trump era. And, I you know, the complications, the ways in which the British are tying themselves around the axle right now over Brexit, almost, almost makes Washington look like a fine-tuned machine. Um, so, but you see that wave of populism, whatever you want to call it, nationalism, authoritarian leaders in many parts of the world, as you said. Part of it is because, you know, the era of globalization euphoria is long mm -hmm. behind us. There were lots of people who did not feel that their boats were being lifted. I think the global financial crisis in 2008 was a pretty stark uh, dividing line, you know, where mm -hmm. lots of people in our society, you know, saw many of the people responsible for what happened in the global financial crisis riding their boats pretty quickly while theirs were stuck or mm -hmm. drifting. And you see that in some other societies too. It's a fear and an anxiety about the changes that people sense or understand that the revolution in technology is going to bring. Um, it's a fear of the other you know, a concern that the cultural identity and, you know, some societies is being challenged, whether it's by demographic changes or migration, a huge force in the world today, intersecting with a set of leaders who are much better at playing on people's fears yeah. than being honest about those changes and then trying to help people not only understand them, but, you know, answer the so what question. So what can we as a society do about some of those right. changes, right. maximize their benefits, minimize their downsides. Mm -hmm. And you, you see precious little of that today. Instead, you see a lot of much more populist leaders, including in Washington, who are in a sense taking advantage of those fears rather than trying to address them in any constructive way. Yeah, yeah. you mentioned the global financial crisis and it, it does strike me that, that you've had the global financial crisis, you've watched that contagion, every, you know, all mm -hmm. sorts of countries being affected. You had the migrant crisis, particularly hitting Europe. And it, it, it's not unusual to respond saying, gee, those politicians who advocated opening and connecting right. our economies and our borders weren't looking out for me right. when, they, when they did it. And no, and, and, I, and, it, and there's also another kind of disconnect, I think, in our own society when you look at foreign policy, you know, between people like me, you know, card-carrying members of the Washington establishment, and lots of American citizens who, when we preach the virtues of disciplined American leadership in the mm -hmm. world, don't need to be persuaded so much, at least in my experience. One of the nice things about being outside government in the last three or four years is the chance to travel around the U.S. Most people don't need, be, need to be persuaded, in my experience, of the value of American engagement in the world. But they're a lot more skeptical about the yeah. discipline part. Yeah. Whether it's the global mm -hmm. financial crisis or another kind of hubris in Iraq in 2003. And that's a disconnect that was not invented by Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. 
and and it's it's you know whomever occupies the White House, the next administration, the one after that, is going to have to come to grips with that. Mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Let me take you back to to an earlier time because you've you've touched a couple of times on on the war in Iraq, and I mm -hmm. want to take you back to Desert Storm, to the original mm -hmm. sure. uh, Persian Gulf War, um, and you worked with Secretary Baker. There was Secretary Baker. There was Colin Powell. There mm -hmm. was uh, a president with a very clear world view. Um, what was what went right when it came to Desert Storm, and then let's compare it to the sure. second, the Iraq War. Well, I mean, yeah. I think there was a sense of strategic purpose. You know, those guys weren't perfect in the George H. W. Bush administration, me included, as a very junior member of that administration. But I think they had a sense of strategic purpose with regard to Desert Storm, the importance of mobilizing a very wide coalition of countries to expel the Iraqis from Kuwait. Including countries in the region. They did. Fight. And, and yeah. they also had a sense of the political value of including, for example, you know, you had Syrian military units mm -hmm. that came to the Gulf, uh, which would have been hard to imagine, you know, a couple of years earlier. They didn't add much, if anything, militarily, but politically it made a big difference yeah. to show such a common front. In addition to strategic purpose, I think that group of statesmen had a sense of strategic empathy, too. I mean, they understood, you know, not just adversaries and what animated them, but they understood how to mobilize a coalition, you know, the different incentives and disincentives you had to use. And then especially in Baker, in the years I worked for him, you know, you had a Secretary of State who was remarkably agile and persistent. And persistence is an undervalued currency, I think, for and diplomats. A, and a very close relationship with the president. Uh, yeah, yeah, an inseparable one, too, which made it a good time to be in the State Department because very mm -hmm. few people wanted to mess with the Secretary of State. But I mean, on the persistent subject of Baker, I remember one vignette which kind of illustrated it, which wasn't exactly a moment in high diplomacy, but in the course of putting together the coalition, Baker spent a fair amount of time with the then bloody dictator of Syria, mm -hmm. Hafez al-Assad, the father of the current bloody yeah. dictator of Syria. And one of their meetings took nine hours straight, longest meeting I ever <laughs> witnessed. Um, and Hafez al-Assad had this very disconcerting habit of sitting almost utterly motionless in his seat for hour after hour, but drink endless cups of sweet Arabic tea. <laughs> Baker, ever the competitive Texan, <laughs> was determined to match him cup for cup and not move. Well, about four hours into the <laughs> long meeting, our then ambassador in Damascus, a wonderful American diplomat, cracked and invented an excuse about urge an urgent telephone call he had to make. <laughs> he had urgent business, but it was not a telephone call. Mm -hmm. um, and then Baker and Assad spent the next 45 minutes, you know, uh, you know, commiserating about bladder-challenged American diplomats. <laughs> so, so persistence counts too. But it was a remarkable group of people. And then the other thing too about Desert Storm, which I think bears on what came, you know, less than a decade later, or roughly a decade later, um, is, you know, that they also had a sense that when the easiest thing in the world, militarily, after Saddam's forces in a span of a few days had been pushed out of Kuwait, would have been to pursue them all the way to Baghdad and topple the regime. And they made the quite conscious choice not to do that because they knew first it would fracture that coalition which was animated by a single purpose, expelling the Iraqis from Kuwait. Second, I think they were rightly worried about what the day after the toppling of Saddam Hussein would look like. And third, Baker himself already had the idea of using the political capital that that success <coughs> produced to make progress on the Arab-Israeli issue, which mm -hmm. he later did in the Madrid Peace Conference yeah. eight or yeah. nine months later. Yeah. So what impressed me at that time was you know, they, they were able to balance a willingness to take calculated risks, because it was not a sure thing to put that coalition together, but also restraint at the right time. And that's, that's the hardest balance, I think, in statesmanship to produce, and they uh, exemplified it. Yeah. And they were operating uh, on, on a ac widely accepted norm of the right. inviolability of borders. Right. So no Backed one up by you know, a dozen UN Security Council right. resolutions and yeah. a mammoth international coalition. But if the minute they started a march to Baghdad, you're in a different, you were in a, a different realm. That would have fractured. And they also right. had a sense that, you know, here, you know, the, the Cold War had ended. The Soviet Union was about to break apart. Um, and which they didn't know at the time, but you yeah. could see it coming. 
Um, and, and so they also had a sense that this moment of profound transformation on the international landscape, you had to look ahead to the kind of order that you wanted to help shape you know, yeah. after the end of the Cold War. Yeah, yeah. Well, so let's go forward on, on, mm -hmm. on Jim Baker's watch um, and George Herbert Walker Bush's um, watch. You had the dissolution of the Warsaw Pact mm -hmm. um, as well as this invasion of Kuwait. Um, and you had, you know, this enormous transition to help manage. And in your book, you make clear that successful diplomacy is all about management, not control. Yeah, or solutions um, sometimes. It's really about managing problems and right. leaving it in a slightly better place for your successors. You know, occasionally you get that rare opportunity to solve a problem, yeah. but that's all t all unfortunately all too rare in diplomacy. Yeah. So, so talk a little bit about um, that administration's approach to Gorbachev mm -hmm. uh, and to the reunification of Germany in the first instance. Well, I mean, I think the reunification of Germany and keeping it within NATO barely a year after the fall of the Berlin Wall um, was a pretty dramatic achievement. It, in hindsight, like so many things in hindsight, it looks foreordained. You know, it looks like it was inevitable. It sure didn't look that way at mm -hmm. the time. Mm -hmm. I um, mean, it required a really deaf diplomacy and getting back to the strategic empathy point, an understanding of Gorbachev's predicament too, as mm -hmm. though basically his world was coming down around him. So it's fashionable in Washington today to talk about re-injecting swagger into mm -hmm. American diplomacy. Mm -hmm. If ever there was a moment when American leaders could have swaggered, that was it. You did not see George H.W. Bush or James Baker or Brent Scowcroft swaggering. They did not spike the football on top of the Berlin Wall. And, you know, that was also, I think, a remarkable lesson in style, which, you know, oftentimes matters mm -hmm. um, in diplomacy as, as much as the substance. Now, part of the uh, conversation that, that Baker had with Gorbachev, mm -hmm. that always was saying, you know, we, we, we want Germany to be a, a part of NATO, and, and we won't go further. Right. NATO won't expand further. Well, of course, he turned out to be wrong, because when Clinton came in, mm -hmm. at least in Clinton's second term, I guess it was, mm -hmm. uh, they expanded NATO right up to Russia's border. Talk a little bit about the consequences of that decision in your view. Yeah, I mean, I think in the mid-90s, you know, after I had served Baker, I went to become the chief political officer at the U.S. Embassy in Moscow. And so sitting there in the early mid-1990s, and, and, you know, if you want to understand the smoldering aggressiveness of Vladimir Putin's Russia, it helps to understand the chaos and disorder, the, you know, really curious mix of hope and humiliation um, at the end of the Cold War and with the fall of, you know, the, the demise of communism that lots of Russians felt in that period. And so what I tried to convey, what my colleagues and I tried to convey in Moscow in that period was don't underestimate, you know, the Russian sense once they're back on their feet, um, which will come someday, that they had been taken advantage of at their moment of historical weakness. Now, if I were sitting in the U.S. Embassy in Warsaw, you know, my argument would have been you have to understand the historical insecurities of Poles caught between the ambitions of Germans and Russians for, for centuries. So I never thought that that first wave of NATO expansion, which, as you said, took place in the second Clinton administration, the Central and East European countries, and even the next wave uh, in the early 2000s, the Baltic states, mm -hmm. that either of those, I think we underestimated the Russian back blow to that. But I honestly don't think that they were a lethal blow to U.S.-Russian relations. Where I do think we made a mistake was 10 years later. Mm -hmm. I was by then ambassador in Russia. Um, and at the very end of the George W. Bush administration, we pushed hard to open the door formally to NATO membership for Ukraine and Georgia. And I hate yeah. the term red line. But, you know, it was the reddest of red lines, not just for Putin, but for even his most progressive critics. Yes. Um, yes. Because for Russians, you know, it was very hard to see themselves as a major power, you know, if, if, you know, NATO included Ukraine, for example, too. And I'm not trying to suggest that that in any way justified Putin's aggression against Georgia in 2008 or Ukraine in 2014, but it fed his narrative, a narrative that he used very effectively inside Russia to justify political repression. What was interesting <coughs> to me at the time was that we seemed to be ignoring our own history, and that is to say the decision after World War II not to humiliate right. Germany once again and to embed it in a larger order, political, economic, and security order, uh, and 
that seemed to work out quite well. Whereas that's humiliation betwe between the two wars worked out so badly. Were we, I mean, you're, you're far wiser than I and more of a, a, really? a student of yeah. history. Um, would, would that not have been a more apt uh, way of looking at things? So, so gee, you integrate know, them, don't isolate them, integrate them. Broadly speaking, that's exactly right. I mean, I think the problem with, with Russia after the you know, collapse of the Soviet Union, I'm not a fatalist, but I think you were bound to have a certain amount of tension mm -hmm. as Russia adjusted to a role as kind of junior partner of the United yeah. States, which came, which is very difficult. I mean, you know, Americans sometimes think we're exceptional. Russians have their own mm -hmm. sense of exceptionalism. And so there was bound to be a certain amount of tension. You know, there was this debate in the late 1990s of who lost Russia mm -hmm. after the clearly an authoritarian turn it began. I always thought that was the wrong question. Russia was never ours to lose. Mm -hmm. Sure, there were ways we could have played our hand better in that period. Um, but I think, you know, Russians had lost confidence in themselves, mm -hmm. you know, after mm -hmm. the end of the Cold War. And, you know, they were going to have to rebuild their own society. And, you know, some people had argued that if we had had a massive Marshall Plan yeah. for Russia, that that would have made a big difference. And we certainly made mistakes in the advice we gave to the Russians in the Yeltsin period about privatization and, you know, a number of other things that turned out to enrich a pretty small number of oligarchs in mm -hmm. Russia. But I think at the end of the day, you know, to have embarked on a huge Marshall Plan would have required a degree of intrusion mm -hmm. into Russian decision making that I don't think many Russian mm -hmm. leaders would have mm -hmm. tolerated. Mm -hmm. um, so sure, we could have played our hand better tactically at different times. Um, and certainly, as I said, I think that effort in 2008 on NATO expansion was a significant mistake. One thing that <coughs> did work pretty well was our approach to nuclear weapons material and technology yes. uh, that had been in, in four different <laughs> uh, locations in the, in the Soviet Union and in four different right. successor states uh, known as non-Lugar. Right. That was something that the Clinton administration embraced wholeheartedly yes. and in fact drew in many of us who had been involved in the ideation to begin with to execute on it. But then that the interest in it fell off right. in, in George W. Bush's administration. I was wondering if you had a sense as to why, until 9-11. Right. And then suddenly the mind was really focused on well, non-state actors getting their hands on. Yeah, well, uh, first, I mean, on the non-Lugar program, I think it was one of the smartest kind of assistance initiatives that the United States has embarked on since the Marshall Plan at the end of the Second World War. And, you know, Senator Lugar, who just passed last mm -hmm. week, was a, a wonderful man. And, you know, it was a reminder that bipartisanship in Washington, none was a Democrat, uh, Lugar a Republican, um, was possible. Yeah. Um, and it still ought to be possible. And here was actually an initiative that came largely from the Congress in this in, in this sense. And the Clinton administration worked very closely with Nunn and Lugar. But it's a reminder of yeah. you know what once was and what ought to be, I, I think, in the future. I'll take a step back from yeah. that. And that is that it came from think tanks mm -hmm. and foundations, Carnegie Endowment being one of right. those think tanks right. that played a role um, in it. So yeah. it, it's a real, it's a lesson on how our different sectors can work together to, you know, and, and if you've got no, really sage true. leaders, then, uh, then it really works. But it's let's not forget Carnegie Endowment's no, role. No, no, thank you. <laughs> thank you for the shameless plug. And <laughs> no, and, and yeah, the, the it's the part about wise leaders that's the challenge, I think, yeah, yeah. these days, yeah. So uh, as though the rest of the world were, were, were keeping calm and quiet during that period, you had the unraveling of states at the same time. So you think about what happened to Yugoslavia right. and Bosnia and then later Kosovo. And we were watching a similar uh, picture than we're watching today mm -hmm. of, of migrants uh, pretty frantically trying to find mm -hmm. another, find safety elsewhere in Europe, and there was an, it seemed to be a kind of an inability to act on the part of, of Western governments, uh, including ours. Yes. Did we just lack a framework? Did we not know what the political permissions were? What froze us in place after some pretty brilliant diplomacy? I think part of it was, this was at the tail end of the Bush 41 administration. Um, you know, President Bush was sinking quickly in the polls. It was an administration that was exhausted in some ways. Mm -hmm. The 
the the whole momentum within American society at the end of the Cold War was to look inward and mm -hmm. you know sort of focus on a lot of obvious domestic mm -hmm. uh, problems, and there wasn't a lot of appetite for you know international interventions. And then the Clinton administration came in very much focused. In fact, part of the reason the president won the election was to focus on the economy, and so there wasn't as much appetite for that. Yeah. And I think. The dilemma always is that, you know, early on in a crisis like that, like in the former Yugoslavia, is the moment when a relatively modest application of power yeah. can make a big difference. The longer you wait, the higher the cost comes for yeah. intervention, too. And that was the lesson in Bosnia. And there was a lack of appetite on, on Capitol Hill. There was. As well. well. It was a shared lack of appetite. Yeah, right. yeah. So, so let's... Uh, unfortunately, there are many such examples. Yes. Uh, we had the genocide in Rwanda. We had, well, this sort of allergy after what happened in Somalia right. as well, so in Mogadishu. So that, mm. I, I remember at one point, um, folks from, from the, the Clinton White House reached out to uh, members of Congress uh, about a possible intervention in, mm -hmm. in, in similar circumstances and, and were told, you know, sure, you can commit troops, but if if one soldier dies, right. and if one gets sick, <laughs> you'll never be able to. Well, sort of, it was kind of guaranteed that one person would get the flu. That's so a pretty and yeah, <laughs> high bar. Yeah. yeah. So that was how how much resistance there was to action. Okay, I'm going to jump you to today because mm. um, because a, one big issue that's in the news is Iran. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, it seems to me I could have said that to you any day mm. if you came here. It's, <laughs> it's Iran. Now it's Iran again. Yeah. Um, and, and we've got, a, you know, battleships headed to Iran. Um, the claim is that, or, the, or the, the reason given is that there's some indication that they're about to have an act, some kind of act of aggression. Um, there's some who doubt that. There's some mm. who think, gee, this is, this is neither about some immediate danger, mm -hmm. um, nor is it about what I, I think most news outlets are saying about getting a better deal at the negotiating yeah. table, that really this is another attempt at regime change in that part of the world. Mm. First, I'd love to have your assessment of whether sure. that's right. Um, but second, I guess I wonder what we can afford. By we, I say the world. You've got Yemen, yeah. you've got Syria, you've got Iraq still, you know, not fully together. No. Afghanistan, can we afford an It's not exactly Iran? like it's a region with a shortage of troubles like yeah. that. Yeah. Um, well, I'd say several things. First, you know, I'm not exactly objective on this issue. I led the secret nuclear talks with the Iranians through all of 2013. Um, to this day, it surprises me that we were able, in this day and age, to keep it quiet as long as we did. And through that's the reference to back channel in your... I, there were a couple right different ones. There was yeah. a Qaddafi one, too, yeah. which I'm glad to talk about since he's by far the most peculiar leader I ever dealt with. <laughs> but, but on Iran... Um, you know, and this came against the backdrop of a very sustained effort in President Obama's first term to build leverage against the Iranians, to demonstrate that we weren't the problem, we were prepared to deal directly. Yeah. In the first term of the Obama administration, the Iranians weren't prepared to deal seriously in nuclear negotiations. So in a sense, we used that test of their intentions as an investment mm -hmm. in a wider coalition of countries. So by the beginning of President Obama's second term in early 2013, Iranian oil exports had dropped by 50%. The value of their currency had dropped by 50%. Their minds were focused, and Obama was ready to engage directly. Because um, it wasn't about pressure for the sake of pressure. It was pressure to produce a workable diplomatic agreement, which would prevent the Iranians from developing a nuclear weapon. So the which they were just months away from. They, they were, by you know whatever calculation you use. And there was a danger of conflict in that times, too. Certainly yeah. the Israeli government, I think, was you know leaning further and further forward in that direction and pressing Obama in that direction as well. So you know what we produced coming out of the secret talks and then eventually working with you know our international partners was an interim deal that froze their program, rolled it back in some important respects, um, imposed some quite intrusive monitoring and verification procedures, uh, all in return for very modest sanctions relief. We preserved most of that for the later comprehensive talks. Um, was it a perfect deal? No, but perfect isn't on the menu in mm -hmm. diplomacy. I believe to this day it was the best of the available alternatives, as was the comprehensive agreement that emerged. It did not solve the problem 
of the threats that Iran posed through behavior in the Middle East, our interests, the interests of our friends, but it removed the most imminent risk, which mm -hmm. was an unconstrained nuclear program in Iran. What I worry about today, it's now been tomorrow is the one year anniversary of President, Obama, uh, President Trump bailing out of the nuclear agreement, is that it's not aimed, as you, were, as you rightly suggested, at a better deal. What it's aimed at is producing either the capitulation of this theocratic regime in Tehran or its implosion. Mm -hmm. And I think tactically, what you know you see the sort of current buildup aimed at is provoking the Iranians, and they're quite capable of taking threatening action. So I'm not trying to suggest that you know we should underestimate that threat, but aimed at I think provoking them either to walk out of the nuclear deal themselves, in which yeah. case we can rationalize even more pressure, or to take a shot at us, in which case you know I think John Bolton at least would you know wouldn't mind at all the opportunity to punch them in the nose mm -hmm. and the problem with that is as we've seen all too often in the Middle East is escalations get very hard to manage especially in a region with so many players and so many currents and so it's a very long-winded way of saying I agree with you I think there's a lot of risk in the situation right now and I I, again, I think it was a significant mistake to bail out of the nuclear agreement um, because not only because of the danger of collisions, whether they're advertent ones or inadvertent ones, because it widens the fissures between us and our closest European allies, in a sense doing Vladimir Putin's work for him, yeah, yeah. Um, I think it erodes the utility of sanctions. And you know, Lord knows we haven't always used sanctions well in the past. We've overused them sometimes. But sometimes they've been quite effective. I think the Iran case you know, through the Obama administration was one of those. Um, but over time, you know, even the foreign minister of Germany a year ago stood up publicly and said, we all need to reduce our vulnerability to the American financial system. Mm -hmm. So we're going to wake up in a few years and realize that what was once, when used wisely, an effective tool is no longer so effective. And that stems in part from our ability under the agreement to use secondary sanctions. Well, and to do so it internationally, <coughs> because yeah. the uni you know, in, in my experience anyway, it's when sanctions have been broadly shared, mm -hmm. even if grudgingly, because you know, the Chinese and the Russians certainly controlled their enthusiasm for the sanctions against yes. Iran. Yeah. But it was effective because the Iranians, in a sense, were cornered by economic and political isolation. And what we've done by withdrawing from the agreement, instead of isolating the Iranians, we're isolating yeah. ourselves, yeah. I'm afraid. And, but there are instances. I mean, Iran, I think, was one of them. Libya was another. Going back to the George H.W. Yeah. Bush administration, you know, where we use sanctions in, a, in an effective way. Yeah. Actually, talk about that, because that was a yeah. very interesting moment where you know, a country chose to denuclearize as a... Well, it was another back-channel, you know, negotiation, w which, which I helped lead um, right after 9-11. You know, Gaddafi, as I said, the strangest leader I ever had to deal with, um, you know, w his mind was focused. International sanctions had brought a fair amount of pressure against Libya for over a decade, going back to the Bush 41 administration. We laid out a set of, I think, realizable goals. In other words, we told him this wasn't about regime change. This was about fundamental changes in your behavior. And as, as a result of those back-channel talks, because it made sense to do it quietly, and the British helped facilitate them, we didn't have normal diplomatic relations with Libya. Um, Gaddafi basically accepted responsibility uh, for the Lockerbie terrorist attack, mm -hmm. uh, for which you know, he was responsible in late 1988. Um, I had had a friend um, with whom I had served in Jordan in the early 1980s who was killed on that flight, who was on his way home from Beirut to see his wife and two young children then. So, you know, in all the hours I spent with Gaddafi, you know, I never forgot that. Um, but, you know, and then, and then that led, once we accomplished that, Gaddafi basically got out of the business of terrorism uh, and then gave up what was a rudimentary nuclear program in large part because we coupled pressure with a willingness to engage directly and drive hard-nosed bargains. This wasn't about capitulation or regime change as well, but Gaddafi is a memorable figure to deal with. I remember times I saw him, um, he, his favorite time to meet was about 3 o'clock in the morning, which was not my prime time, <laughs> and usually out in the desert in a tent. And you know, I remember one time seeing him again in the middle of the night, 
His tent was not lavishly furnished. It was kind of white plastic lawn chair furniture. And you'd be sitting talking to him. And he had this really also disconcerting habit of pausing in mid-conversation and staring up at the ceiling for three or four minutes at a time. So I'm a (laughs) trained diplomat, you know, supposed to carry on conversations. And the only thing that made this actually workable was Gaddafi was a flashy dresser. So on this one occasion, he's wearing what was basically a pajama top with photographs of dead African dictators on it. So what I would spend the three or four minutes while he's staring up at the ceiling, guessing how many of the (laughs) African dictators I could identify. And because he paused a lot, I got pretty good by the end. (laughs) The other other Gaddafi uh, vignette, some of you may remember, he came to speak to the United Nations General Assembly September of 2009, I think. And, you know, leaders are supposed to come and speak for no more than 10 minutes. So Gaddafi gets up there and he has these scraps of paper. He didn't have a text that kept falling off the podium. And so he's reaching down and he's meandering all over the place. 90 minutes, he goes on. I was listening to the Arabic language UN interpreter, who's a really accomplished interpreter. You also speak Arabic. Yeah, Arabic. but it was, you know, it was good to improve your Arabic to listen to this. But 75 minutes into his 90 minutes, you hear the interpreter. <laughs> interpreter say, I can't take this anymore in Arabic, <laughs> and throws, throws his headpiece off. And so the last 15 minutes, you know, people are on their own. Um, so, you know, Gaddafi was a bloodily repressive dictator. And, you know, while we were able to, through diplomacy, to change behavior, to extract certain actions which suited our interests, what we weren't going to change was his bloody repression of his own people. And that's what was his undoing and remains, you know, the mess that Libya is today. We went in, uh, NATO mm-hmm. went in, uh, yeah. as is part of NATO, um, on under this sort of a more relatively new at that point yeah. concept of responsibility mm-hmm. to protect the Russians who were close allies of, of right. Gaddafi uh, allowed that to happen. Right. You know, did not, and... Um, uh, our mission changed very quickly from yeah. a, from an effort to protect the citizens to regime change. Yeah. What impact did that have on Putin's thinking? I think it had a pretty significant impact on Putin's thinking. You know, he in this period had receded a little bit from public view. He was the prime minister, no longer the president, although he was still yeah. the central decision maker in Russia. Um, But, you know, he watched over and over again, according to reliable reports, the footage of Gaddafi being beaten to death, you know, outside a drainage pipe. And, you know, for Putin, he connected dots that weren't meant to be connected. And so he saw a regime change in one part of the world as part of, you know, an active, systematic, well-choreographed American effort to change regimes around the world. And he he thought the same thing of the much more peaceful color revolutions in Georgia in 2003, Ukraine in 2004. Mm -hmm. So one of the reasons, you know, that animated Putin when he returned to the Kremlin, you know, after this experiment with uh, being the prime minister, was because I think he was convinced that, you know, his strong hand was required. And, Mm -hmm. you know, when you've been in power for now almost 20 years, as he's been, it's easy to convince yourself that you're Mm -hmm. indispensable. But I think that had a a significant impact in his thinking in that period. I don't fault, I mean, I think President Obama, if you put yourself back in his shoes in the the military intervention, it would have been hard not to act. Mm -hmm. You had a Security Council resolution, you had the Arab League of all organizations calling on the United States and the yeah. Security Council to intervene militarily, the Arab League, which rarely agrees on anything. This was in large part because Gaddafi at one time or another had tried to off just about everybody yeah. sitting around the Arab <laughs> League table. You had you know, some of our closest Arab partners, the Emiratis and the Jordanians, saying that they would participate in a military yeah. uh, effort. You had the British and French champing at the bit uh, to intervene. So it would have been hard not to intervene. What we got wrong, though, all of us, me included, were our assumptions about how hard it would be to restore order and security. Because without that, and this is a lesson we should have learned earlier, um, it's impossible to you know, revive a society as well. Um, and then, of course, came the you know, terrible attack in Benghazi, which killed four of my colleagues there. And you know, after that, the American appetite for you know, really active diplomatic intervention was pretty much shot. It, it it does raise two questions, and one of that is yes. like our ability to to rebuild. You know, do we do we, diplomacy gives us an opportunity to right. prevent wars? 
uh, one hopes. I mean, that's a, that's that's a goal. Um, but once you've had a war, right. we've only had one big, whopping, wonderful example of the Marshall Plan working right. in Europe. But Europe was really a unique set of circumstances, yeah. not the same as Iraq, not the same no. as Libya in any way. Um, let's say that lesson is learned. Does it just tell you to get much more caution in terms of intervening, or no? I mean, I do think we, yes. Have we learned better how to how to rebuild. Well, I mean, I think you have to learn discipline. You have to learn a balance between ends and means. You know, in the pendulum always swings too widely in Washington, and you know, in some ways, in American society in mm -hmm. general. I mean, the current you know, more unilateralist view of President Trump, um, you know, is not unique in American history. There have been moments when you've, we've either been isolationist or unilateralist. Um, so it's that balance which really requires strong leadership as well. You know, we learned the hard way in Iraq and Afghanistan that, you know, there are limits to our capacity to do nation building overseas. Um, you know, we had a situation even just looking at diplomacy where in some respects, I think I had lots of colleagues who were doing really hard work in hard places in Iraq and Afghanistan, but it almost became, you know, the as if we were the British colonial service, you know, in the mm -hmm. 19th century, expected to rebuild, you know, Afghan society, Iraqi mm -hmm. society, which was beyond the capacity for all the strides we helped Afghan women make, for example, which are enormously important. You know, there are limits, and matching ends to means is always one of the biggest challenges in American mm -hmm. statecraft. Mm -hmm. Syria, here's mm -hmm. another case where you've got a Russian ally, mm -hmm. a, a horrible civil war. I mean, uh, there's uh, you know, something we should all want to you know, yes. succeed in stopping. Um, the natural tendency for us would have been, I think, to, to turn to NATO and say, yes. you know, what can, what can we do? But Putin would have been, again, in the situation of demonstrating that he's an awful ally to have. Yep. Um, and uh, th this isn't an argument for <laughs> anything or excusing mm. anything, but um, I, I wonder how much the Libyan experience taught him you know, stick by your Putin. ally. Yeah, yeah, no, I think, you know, Putin, as well as the Iranians, who probably have even more leverage in Syria than the Russians do, um, I always thought we're going to double down, no matter what we or other outsiders yeah. did to preserve the Bashar al-Assad regime with all yeah. of its bloody repressiveness. Um, it's hard to see our own experience, including my own, in Syria from 2011 on as anything other than a painful policy failure. Um, I think what happened is the classic case we were discussing before of ends and means. We ended up drifting toward maximalist ends, mm -hmm. you know, where mm -hmm. with kind of the Roman Colosseum style of diplomacy where Assad must go, which he richly deserved. The problem is when the United States does that, people expect that we're going to deliver it. Mm -hmm. But we had maximalist ends, whether it was there or the red line over the use of chemical weapons mm -hmm. against your own people, a, a important international norm. And then I think, you know, so ends that were too maximalist and means that were too minimalist. Right. Because if you added up everything we did in Syria to support the opposition from 2011 to 2015, it's actually pretty impressive cumulatively. But we did it so grudgingly and incrementally that it never had the impact that Putin's intervention in September of 2015 mm. did, which wasn't, you know, a, a huge in scale in military terms, but he did it in a very telescoped way mm -hmm. to maximize the political and diplomatic impact. Mm -hmm. So I always had huge, um, you know, sympathy for, you know, President Obama's reluctance with mm -hmm. the shadow not just of Libya hanging over American policy, but of Iraq 2003, yeah. not yeah. to get sucked down another slippery slope toward a, you know, a major U.S. military intervention. Um, but it was very hard to strike that balance yeah. between ends and means. I, I'm going to, since you just mentioned President Obama, mm -hmm. turn to a, another vignette in your book, and mm -hmm. that was President the, the point at which President Obama decided to go ahead and and strike you know kill uh, bin Laden in uh -huh. that compound in Pakistan um, it's a it's a fascinating story of Hillary Rodham Clinton's mm -hmm. um, uh, sort of self-discipline and management style but also of his and of his comfort with risk yeah bearing in mind that his vice president was recommending against right. it uh, Bob Gates was recommending mm -hmm. against it 
tell the tale from your eyes, what you what you were part of. Sure. Well, I mean, I, you know, I didn't play a major role in that, but you know, this was a very tightly kept secret. Other than the Iran secret nuclear negotiations, the tightest compartment I experienced. So, for most of the spring of 2011, the late winter and spring, I was the only other person in the State Department other than Hillary Clinton, then the Secretary, who was brought into this group and. You know, it was remarkable to watch because, you know, oftentimes presidents have to make the 51-49 calls. The 90-10 calls get made lower down. Mm -hmm. And in this case, even right up to the end, I remember the, you know, the last sort of cabinet level meeting that the president had, which was on a Thursday before the strike took place on Sunday. Um, you know, the best judgment of the intelligence community was not much better than 50-50, right. that Obama mm -hmm. was the tall guy who you could see from satellite the, imagery Osama. was that Osama, I'm sorry, that Osama was the tall guy, you know, who was, you know, walking in this compound mm -hmm. um, in Abbottabad near, not too far from Islamabad in Pakistan. Um, and um, so it was a very tough call. And as you mm -hmm. said, some of the president's advisors in whom he had great trust, the vice president, the secretary of defense, were for understandable reasons reluctant. Um, Bob Gates had, been uh, a special assistant to the director of central intelligence in 1980 mm -hmm. when the United States tried and failed in Iran to rescue um, you know American diplomats held hostage there and that contributed to the collapse of the Carter administration mm -hmm. as well so you know their reservations were honest ones too yeah. come come by honestly but I remember, you know, Hillary Clinton, I think and remember we had talked about this in the car ride on the way over just believed that you know, basically we couldn't forgive ourselves if we didn't take advantage of this opportunity, that even if it was 50-50, was, those were still better odds than at any moment we had had since 9-11. Um, and, and, and the president, I thought, made a quite courageous decision because it was not a sure thing. And it it was, was a remarkable display, though, of what the U.S. Special Forces can do. Yeah. But in that case, wasn't there a helicopter accident as well? There was, Just yeah. as there was in the Ar Iran hostage. There was, and rescue. I'm sure there are lots of people like Secretary Gates who are having flashbacks then, too, yeah. because, yeah, no, the, the two helicopters that came in, the first one had had to make a kind of crash landing and then yeah. had to be destroyed. Fortunately, nobody was, you know, killed or injured yeah. in the in the helicopter crash. But, yeah, that was a moment when you wondered, because it you really were... You know, it was a big risk in many ways, but you're also risking a presidency as well, yeah. too. Yeah. But it was the right call, and for all the criticism, unfair, I always thought, that President Obama got for, you know, being too deliberate or too cautious in making decisions, um, this was a real risk. Yeah. And yeah. It, it turned out, you know, well for all of and, us. And, and the risk was a huge risk politically, domestically, and that did not drive his 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 thinking in the end, which I thought was quite striking. No, it's, it's no, it was pretty remarkable to to witness. Yeah, so we've got question cards from the audience that I, I have so many things I want to ask you about. Um, like, yeah, I, I want to know whether Gaddafi really did have an emerald green jumpsuit. That I remember oh. during during the Reagan administration, yeah. he at one point. He started driving a motorboat around the Mediterranean in okay. an emerald green jumpsuit to sort of thumb his nose at the Americans. And I thought, you know, Yeah, I don't know who he was thumbing his nose at. He had know. a purple <laughs> moo moo, I remember, on one occasion, <laughs> too. So, yeah. so we haven't talked about, um, we haven't talked about China. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the most important competitors, probably the most important competitor we have, you know, mm -hmm. sort of, both economically and, and as a military competitor and, and even a cultural one. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's, pr I don't know if we've ever had a competitor that had all those attributes. So the question cards mostly relate to the Belt and Road Initiative. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but I also want to kind of pile on and mm -hmm. add the question of, of, you know, how wise it was to pull out of the TPP. The trans, you know, yeah. Trans-Pacific Partnerships. That what is there? Twelve. Well, we've got the former ambassador to to Australia sitting there who can tell us what was right about it and what was wrong about pulling out of it. Um, but you know, there was an attempt to pull together twelve countries around a yeah. trade agreement. We were freezing out China from that. Um, and and you know, tell us the logic of that and the logic of withdrawing from it. Well, I think it was a really foolish thing to pull out of that agreement. Again, as I said before, you know, it's not a perfect agreement, 
perfect is not on the menu for trade agreements either. But uh, you know, I think it's it it was and is an agreement that would have created a high end set of trade and investment standards and would have done more than any other trade agreement I had seen uh, with regard to labor and environmental standards as well. Mm -hmm. um, so it was part of an effort. You know, there's a lot of talk in Washington today about containing China's rise. I've always thought that the more logical way of looking at competition with China, which is the single most consequential challenge on the landscape, far out as I can see into the 21st century, is less about containing China's rise and more about shaping the environment into which China rises. We have a lot of assets. You know, there are a lot of countries from India through Southeast Asia, as the ambassador knows, and Australia, um, to Northeast Asia, our traditional mm -hmm. treaty allies in South Korea and Japan, who don't really want to be forced to make a choice between the United States and China, but share an interest that China's rise not come at the expense of their security and prosperity. Mm -hmm. So you can use those partnerships, our alliances, as well as mechanisms like the Trans-Pacific Partnership in a way that inevitably is going to shape the incentives and disincentives of the Chinese leadership mm -hmm. over mm -hmm. time. It can feed the sense of people within the Chinese system who are smart enough to know that there are reforms that are important not as a favor to the United States, but in China's own self-interest. And so that's in many ways a challenge for diplomacy, is how do you take advantage of those assets across Asia? And I fear that our much more unilateral approach today um, sort of misses you know, some of those big assets that we have. And we've created a pattern of retreat from a whole series of international agreements, the Paris Climate Agreement, the TPP, the Iran Nuclear Agreement, um, which you know, I think really undercuts um, our influence at a moment, and especially with regard to dealing with China, this is going to be a pretty intense competition. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we need to mobilize as many other countries as share our concerns as we can. Mm -hmm. um, other courts uh, ask whether the Belt and Road Initiative is in essence a Marshall Plan, only more, more broadly, on the part of, it, of, of the Chinese. Yeah, I mean, it's a yeah. really ambitious initiative, and anybody who thinks it's just about infrastructure is kidding themselves. And this is about, you know, long-term strategic ambition, I think, for China across the Eurasian supercontinent. I, I do, however, think that there are also some built-in obstacles as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, anybody who's tried to do business in Central Asia is going to find that it's mm -hmm. a lot easier said than done. Um, and, you know, I think there's, there's a resistance that starts to build in some of those societies. You see it in Africa today now, where a lot of big Chinese infrastructure projects don't create local jobs. You know, the jobs are imported from China. Um, and, you know, it locks a lot of countries into a sizable debt as well, which, com you know, can complicate their lives in later years. So we're not going to match the Chinese dollar for dollar in terms of competition, but we need to show up. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I fear that, especially if you look at the huge number of senior vacancies and embassies, you know, ambassadorial jobs overseas, as well as in senior jobs in Washington, we're just not showing up enough. We're, we're constricting our diplomatic service while the Chinese are expanding theirs, and there's a lesson in that too, yeah, I think. Yeah. <coughs> um, a, another question card didn't relate to China, but it, it related to the use of foreign aid, mm -hmm. both for positive purpose, but also the denial of foreign aid yeah. uh, as well. And in particular, uh, the case of, of Nicaragua, Honduras, El Salvador, yeah. the sources of those migrants and asylum seekers that are coming to our border. I mean, I think that was also a spectacularly foolish decision. Um, you know, th there is a challenge of migration of people coming out of those three countries in Central America in particular, which we need to pay attention to because border security does matter for any sovereign country. But it seems to me that an important part of a comprehensive strategy for dealing with that is to help anchor people in a sense of possibility in their own societies. Mm -hmm. And so the decision to cut aid runs directly counter to that interest. And I've always thought painful, you know, it, it's not easy to undertake, um, but a comprehensive approach makes a lot more sense. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, as I said, this uh, I think is going to turn out to be a very big mistake. Mm -hmm. In terms of values as well as In terms of values, yeah, in terms of values as well, which is why, you know, the use, uh, 
always hate the term carrots and sticks. And I remember one of the first times we engaged the Iranians in the secret talks, and some American policymakers had used this term carrots and sticks. And the, my counterpart, the Iranian negotiator, was the one time he got really animated in the meeting and said, we're not donkeys. You know, you mm. can't deal mm. with us with carrots and sticks. Mm. And so the stick part of this, you know, while withholding assistance sometimes has been effective in foreign policy, generally foreign assistance works better when you're looking at it in the affirmative. In other words, mm -hmm. you're trying to anchor people in a sense of possibility in countries which are quite insecure and quite unstable. You're reinforcing the inclinations of committed leaderships in countries. I mean, I think one of the best examples of smart American foreign assistance was the PEPFAR yes. initiative in the George W. Bush administration, which really did, by supporting committed African leaders and civil society activists, help bring Africa, as well as the rest of the world, to the brink, at least, of an AIDS-free generation, which something, you know, 30 years ago mm -hmm. would have been hard, you mm -hmm. know, to, uh, to imagine in some ways, too. That had nothing to do with sort of short-term tactical political considerations. It was an investment in, in this case, a more stable Africa, which again, I think, suffers from neglect today. I mean, Africa is a continent that's going to double in population by the middle of this century. So from one billion people to two billion people. If we're not paying attention, along with African leaders, to problems of food, water, health insecurity, unresolved regional conflicts, corrupt or poor governance, you know, the kind of migration challenges that Europeans have faced in recent years are going to look small by comparison, yeah, I think. Yeah. <coughs> Two other issues that have come up uh, from the audience. One is, is to provide us an update from your perspective of what's happening with North Korea. Um, and, and you might mm -hmm. do sort of a little bit of the history of it as well, sure. uh, by dating back to the Clinton years at least. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I'd be the first person to acknowledge that our record in, in diplomacy with North Korea has not exactly been pristine over the years. So I did not criticize, um, you know, President Trump's kind of unorthodox interest in starting diplomacy at the top, so mm -hmm. engaging Kim Jong-un, with not a lot of preparation ahead of time. But I think after two summits with Kim Jong-un, it's pretty clear to me at least that there's not a chance in the world that any time in the foreseeable future, Kim is going to give up his nuclear stockpile. He mm -hmm. sees it as too crucial, at least for the foreseeable future, to his security, his stature, his survival. So the practical question is, you know, how can you reduce the dangers between now and then, even if you preserve full de de denuclearization mm -hmm. as an aspirational goal? Um, if you set aside the irony of what I'm about to say, you know, actually, the Iran nuclear negotiations are not a bad guide to that. The interim deal, these two situations are not analogous. Iran didn't then, doesn't today have nuclear weapons. The North Koreans have dozens, and they're, as we sit here, expanding their capacity to make more. But if you could freeze that program, roll it back, and especially, you know, impose or introduce some serious verification measures, you would create a more stable and transparent situation the problem would still remain to be solved down the road, but you'd be in a better position to deter North Korea, I think, um, than we are today. But that would mean setting aside the love letters and you know, the kind of diplomacy as an exercise in narcissism, which has largely driven North Korean diplomacy recently. So I'm not in any way objecting to the effort at diplomacy. That's a lot better than fire and fury. Mm -hmm. um, but I just hope at this point we need, it seems to me, to shift gears towards something that's practical and achievable. Because otherwise, you know, you can set up a situation where you start sliding back toward the fire and fury yeah. language. Yeah. Um, <coughs> another questioner asks about Venezuela. Mm -hmm. uh, it looked a, a, a while like Maduro would go. Yeah. Um, in fact, some, some uh, commentators reported that he had fallen. Yeah. Um, but that's not where we are today. What do you foresee in the in the near future? Well, I mean, could I it get worse before it gets better? Yeah, I mean, I, Venezuelans, in my view, I'm no expert on Latin America, but would certainly be better off with a different leadership. Mm -hmm. I think Chavez and now Maduro have essentially ruined what could be a pros should be a prosperous um, Latin society and a partner of the United States as well as its neighbors. Um, I think the administration in trying to mobilize and work with a coalition of countries to build political and economic pressure. Mm -hmm. That demonstrates the right instinct. 
what I hope are two things. First, that the administration doesn't succumb to the temptation to use force because the history of American military intervention in our own hemisphere is a pretty checkered one, to mm -hmm. put it diplomatically, and I'm not sure that would end well. Um, and there's a danger of sort of provoking you know, a situation where then it's easier to use force, and, and I hope we're not gonna do that. And second, I hope that, you know, bearing in mind the lessons we were talking about before in the Middle East, we're thinking about the day after. Because the challenge here, I think, is to somehow get the Venezuelan military to crack. Um, and so far, they've stayed very close to Maduro. Because for the day after, you know, you, you need to preserve, you know, some security forces in that country. Otherwise, you know, you can have the chaos that we've run into in so many other societies on the sort of day after the toppling of a dictator, mm -hmm. too. So um, I hope people are planning for some of those day after challenges, mm -hmm. too, because they can be pretty significant. So we've mostly talked about states, uh, mm -hmm. sometimes crumbling states, but states nonetheless. Um, in your book, you make a very strong case for understanding, better understanding technology and mm -hmm. how it is changing, how it's reshaping not just diplomacy, how it's reshaping uh, the world in which we live in every, in every respect. Yeah. Um, do we have the right kinds of capabilities within the Foreign Service, for example, no. or within the government more broadly? Uh, you know, how ca can government attract a bench scientist and a technologist, and, and, and what kinds of efforts are being made to do so? Yeah, well, the short answer is no, we don't right now, and it's true not just of the State Department, but most parts of the executive mm -hmm. branch of government. You know, I spent way too many hours in senior jobs the last seven or eight years I was in government, sitting in the White House Situation Room with smart, committed people collectively faking it on a lot mm -hmm. of issues of technology, just because in my generation, um, you know, you don't have the depth of expertise that you need. And so the State Department, which, you know, has lots of individuals who are incredibly entrepreneurial and innovative, but as an institution is rarely accused of being too agile or too full of initiative, mm -hmm. um, is gonna have to become more flexible, I think. Mm -hmm. We used to have, for example, a mid-career entry program when I was a young diplomat. We need to recreate that mm -hmm. because you're gonna have to attract people who have already you know, been successful in the world of technology, who might be interested in coming, maybe it's only for two or three years to work in government. I think you can appeal to people's sense of patriotism and national purpose as well. Mm -hmm. um, so you're gonna have to be able to import some of those skill sets because it's a classic challenge for diplomacy. This was the case more than 60 years ago at the dawn of the nuclear era, when what diplomats need to do is to help begin to devise workable rules of the road. You know, whether it's to do with the geopolitics of data or cyber instruments which can be used to threaten nuclear command and control systems yes. or critical yeah. infrastructure, you're not gonna do this through some big UN convention because the Chinese and the Russians are gonna have much different views of how you use technology. Their interest right now, at least the leadership's interest, is to use those tools to tighten surveillance states. But I think there are a lot of countries in the world with whom we might not agree on every detail, with whom you could build you know, the beginnings of at least to some rules of the road. And I think that's gonna be important, not just in artificial intelligence or synthetic biology, but a whole range of issues too. And the sooner we wake up to that as a government and in the State Department, the better. So rules of the road norms are mm -hmm. essential. Um, what about mechanisms for decision making, institutions? You know, sure. There's people like me, we, I wring my hands every day over the destruction yeah. of our current institutions that you know, came out of World War II and I, yeah. you know, how wonderful they were. But you know, maybe they do need updating. Um, they do, oh, no, of course so they do. I mean, in terms of the institutions of national security making, yeah. I mean, State Department, as I said, you know, we need to be self-critical to start with because, you know, it's much better to reform yourself from within than have it done mm -hmm. for you by the Congress <laughs> or others. And usually they don't, you know, they're not shy about yeah. doing that. Um, and, that, and that involves, you know, everything from kind of delayering the institution. It's kind of like a, a you know, house that you've put too many coats of paint on. You know, you need, we've become pretty cumbersome in the State Department. Mm -hmm. I remember when I was the number two in the State Department, the deputy secretary, one of my last months on the job, I got a memorandum on a really mundane issue. It was a half page long. 
attached to it were a page and a half of what are called clearances. So every imaginable office in the State Department, and some that I had a hard time imagining, had pronounced judgment on you know everything from the punctuation to the recommendation. That's something we can, you know, the State Department can control itself. Um, and so there's a sort of self-reform that I think is important to do in that institution. We've become a little bit over-centralized, I think, mm -hmm. in decision-making. You know, I worked on the National Security Council staff the end of the Reagan administration when Colin Powell was the National Security Advisor. Mm -hmm. We had 60 professional staff members. By the end of the last administration, mm -hmm. the Obama administration, there were more than 300. Yeah. Now, there's a reason for that. Part of it's integrating economic issues. Part of it was the post-9-11 counterterrorism effort. There are reasons it got bigger. But th that's a lot bigger than it should be, I think, because it tends to then bring out the passive aggressive in institutions like the State Department, where if you don't feel you're part of the takeoff in policy making, you're less invested in the landing, mm -hmm. I think, sometimes, too. And so there are things that can be done. You've seen national security advisors go back and forth between mm -hmm. those who think their job is to, is to coordinate policy right. and those who think it is to make policy and even execute on policy. So and the bigger the staff gets and you generally attract very smart, you yeah. know, committed, hardworking people, the more tempted you're going to be to actually carry out policy as well as just coordinate yeah. it. So uh, I'm just going to end with, with three questions from students, because mm -hmm. in, in case you, you, you worry about the next generation being alert, you'll be over that worry very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, one asks whether the mission for the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, uh, well, notes that it is mm -hmm. to advance peace through analysis, development of fresh policy ideas, and, and direct engagement and collaboration with decision makers. Um, he or she asks, would this include inspiring the next generation of American youth to public service in its many forms in order to advance peace? Well, and that's certainly the case. And, you know, we're a global institution at Carnegie, so we have six centers around the world. So not just in the U.S., but in India, China, and Europe, and the Middle East, and in Russia of all places today. So, but, it, but that's built on the conviction that in today's world, you can't see every problem just through the prism of Washington and American foreign policy, but a large part of what we do is to try to connect to the next generation yeah. of whether it's policy practitioners in the United States or around the world, or people who are going to become civil society activists or play you know, a different mm -hmm. kind of role in international affairs too. Mm -hmm. So the answer to the question is it's very much a priority for us. Yeah. I can't think of anything more important that we can do over the next few years. Yeah. So this is the end of the on the record portion of, of our program tonight and the part that's going to go on radio. Um, and so I just want to ask you to, to thank our guests and then we can have direct questions in the off the record setting. Thanks. Thank you.